Okay, hi everybody. My name is Jessica Algy from the City of Toronto Archives. I am so pleased that Backlane Studios asked to uh, asked me to join you today to uh, talk a little bit about local history research and uh, doing research online. Now, today we're going to focus on one building in one Toronto neighborhood. That's the beautiful Roncesvalles neighborhood. But the idea here is that you can take the techniques that we're going to do today and apply them to any Toronto building, any home, any condo, any neighborhood um, to start uh, fleshing out the story, what archival resources are around for your for your own, you know, for your, for the place where you live. One bit of housekeeping before we start, uh, the Toronto Archives is currently closed. I'm uh, recording this in July of 2021. Uh, this is following pandemic protocols, but we are going to be reopening um, soon. And I want you to know that you can head over to toronto.ca slash archives to get the very latest updates on our reopening plans. Okay, so let's head over into the Toronto Archives. The Archives is a really lovely building. It's uh, opened as the Metro Archives in 1992. And here you can actually see, we have a viewing gallery that allows you to view into the actual record center. Toronto Archives, you can really think of this kind of like the hard copy memory of the city. Uh, here we are storing about 123,000 boxes of material, and that includes well over a million negatives. Um, Every month, there is new content coming into the archives from all of the various departments across the city. It, this is also now the home for all of those amalgamated municipalities that make up Toronto. So the big ones like North York, Scarborough, East York, Etobicoke, also the smaller places that form those municipalities. Think about, you know, uh, Village of Parkdale. Now, some of you had very targeted questions. You want to know exactly what survives in the government archive, in the records for your own community. One of the links I'm going to send you first for those researchers who need to get a better handle on what exists for your own neighborhoods. Um, I'll send you this index here, which it, it allows you to click into different um, government collections and to really get a sense of what survives. It is true that not all municipalities kept their records the same way and not everything survives in the same way. So there will be unique things about the part of the city that you're researching. Now I do know also that there are a lot of people in this group who are actually writers and creatives. And this is um, a, the second index I'm gonna send you. It's a records by topic index for the city of Toronto archives. And I, I use this all the time. Um, it is a wonderful place to start if you are just simply looking for inspiration, especially that crime and punishment section is really, really good. Uh, it, it just gives you a sort of a, a first taste on what kinds of records might exist around certain topics. Now, as you know, today's whole focus is online research, but I can't help myself. I work in the archives. I did pull you a box. We're going to actually open up this box a little later on. This is Rob who pulled this box for me last week. This is a building permit application plan box that we're going to have a look at a little later. But for now, to get started, I want to start by starting to explore the neighborhood we're going to be looking at in depth today. And I want to start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land we're meeting on virtually today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit. So for those of us who are not so familiar with the neighborhood of Roncesvalles, to give you a sense of where we're actually looking, that we're going to be talking today about the land south of Bloor and just to the east of High Park. We're not really all that far from the mouth of the Humber River here, um, and I can't really overstate how deep the uh, historical and First Nations roots run in this neighborhood. You know, this is the area that is home to those centuries old footpaths that form the carrying place, communication paths with the upper Great Lakes. We also know that there are, you know, archaeologically documented large longhouse communities in this neighborhood. I want to show you to start off one of my single favorite maps uh, in the city. This is a hand drawn plan by a guy named John G. Howard. Um, here's Howard's house. Uh, it's called Colburn Lodge. I'm pointing it out because it's still a really brilliant little city museum that you can visit. It's not open at the moment, of course, but I'll definitely encourage you to explore it at some point. Um, why am I showing you this plan? Well, 
Howard's legacy, just shortly after he made this map, he, he gives Toronto, uh, he deeds Toronto his land, which is how we have High Park. So it's a huge gift to, to the city. But what I like about this uh, plan, look at how many of these original waterways, a lot of them are gone today, right, in the re re-diverted into sewers. But look how much the the original waterways are really sort of uh, influencing the landscape and the way that roads get laid out. Here's Indian Road here. You can really feel how it's, you know, it's a bankside trail. Um, I, I just love how you can sort of see the original landscape influencing the city here. Now, if this is your area of interest, this pre-colonial and First Nations history, you're likely going to need to search beyond the City of Toronto Archives. That's because for the most part, with some exceptions, the Toronto Archives collection really specializes what we're best at is 1834 and forward. So Toronto Amalgamation and forward. Um, Archives of Ontario, uh, National Archives, you're probably going to be looking to these resources, but also um, lots of really great resources like the Native Canadian Centre here in Toronto um, and religious archives as well, Roman Catholic Archdiocese archives. We are completely spoiled in Toronto. There's over a hundred archives and you're gonna be getting my top list, the archives that I use the most. Um, so again, that'll come to you in my tip sheet. Last thing I want you to notice here, can you see here, I've, I've cut it off a bit, but it says C-O-L-O-H, Colonel O'Hara. So that's the landowner that actually is responsible for a lot of the names. I want to give you a sense of where Roncesvalles comes from. So Roncesvalles, Sororan, Marion, um, Jeffrey. Uh, O'Hara is a Irishman who settles here in Upper Canada, and he names things primarily after places where he's seen service in the Napoleonic Wars, Roncesvalles in Spain, or members of his family. So that's where a lot of these name origins come today. Now, remember I said today is really sort of a journey and exploration. We are going to be working from the very first point, sort of we're going to do the steps of house research all the way through, and we're going to be using the example of um, Backlane Studios, again, a building on Roncesvalles. The idea here is that what we do today, you can take and apply to any house, any building, any uh, structure in the city, really, um, and do the same type of technique uh, for any area. Now, if you're new to the new to this kind of area, we're going to be looking at the corner of Nipawat and Roncesvalles. If you were coming down from the Dundas West subway station, you'd be coming down by about three blocks. That's where we're at. Here's the building this one here. What's unusual here, it's got a brick front, that's not unusual, but do you see this sort of back T-shaped structure? That's a bit unusual. That's part of the building we're going to be studying today. Now here's what the building looks like from the front. Again, it's a three-story brick structure with resident, uh, sorry, retail on the front, uh, first floor, which is uh, today the Apple, independent Apple store. And then it's got like um, apartments above. Now I'm interested to know how old you think this building is. I'm gonna have a, a little poll. I wanna see if you can just, if you're comfortable, put in a guess on when you think this structure was built. Again, I know you, know you have no background on this. The reason I'm asking you to do this is because more often than not, people actually know a lot more than they think they do. Um, when you come to research, especially your own property, all of that knowledge you already have is, is actually going to be really helpful to you. Okay, while we wait for that number to come in, I'm just gonna move my pole over here. I wanna walk you around the corner. You need to see the back side of this building to kind of understand a bit more about it. So we're going around the corner. Okay, so looking like those answers are coming in. Looks like the number one answer is 1911. So again, we're gonna come back to that number. All right, let's go around the corner. I'm walking you around the corner of Nipawa. Now you can see that back T building that you saw from above. So it's a, it's a long kind of first floor extension with a two-story back building uh, there on the back. If you came to us to research this building at the archives, already my ears would be tingling because it's a sort of unusual shape. Um, okay, so how do we actually start to unpack the story of this building? We're going to be doing it in three chapters. We're going to be starting with maps, then moving to city directories and finishing off with the fun stuff, which is photographs. Okay, so chapter one, maps. 
there are some wonderful map resources available to you online. I'm going to start you off at toronto.ca slash archives. Keep in mind that you don't need to write down web addresses. You will get these, you will get these links. Now to find our maps collection, it's in the what's online link. Click on that now. It'll take you into a what's online landing page. Now lots for you to explore here, especially for those writers and creatives. You may want to spend some time in our web exhibits section. We have just a massive range of topics covered. Um, you and I are doing this targeted research today. So let's pull up the maps link. Uh, here is the maps page. All of these are available to you online. Whatever map collection you choose is going to be based entirely on the when and the where of your research. So if you're researching a bungalow in Scarborough, you're probably not going to be needing the historical maps. You're going to be needing things like aerial photographs because, again, they show us the, the community sort of 1947 and above. But for most of us who are researching a building, let's say if you have a guess that your buildings may be older than about 75 years, almost certainly the, the most useful set of maps for you is the fire insurance plans. I love these maps and I want you to know a little bit about them before I show you, before we use them. Okay, so this is Charles Goad. This is one of the only photographs I'm showing you that's not actually from the Toronto archives. This is a Vancouver archive shot. This guy is fascinating. Charles Goad comes over to Canada from London, England. He's a young guy, he's 21, works on the railway, and then eventually makes his way to Montreal, where he starts a business in surveying and creating maps that are eventually used for fire insurance companies to set fire insurance rates, okay? Now, this is probably the most famous example of a Goads that I know of. This is actually a Goads plate that was uh, that documents all of the destruction created by the 1904 fire, the Great Fire here in Toronto. Uh, can you see these kind of crossed out boxes that say all gone, all gone, all gone? Well, let me show you a photograph. This is Bay in front. This is what it looks like. This is the damage of the Great Fire. Can you see that, you know, newly completed clock tear of old, old City Hall there in the background? This is the kind of thing that you'll find in our web exhibits. We've got a lot of great content. Great Fire, of course, is there. Okay, so goads, how do we actually use them for ourselves? So fire insurance plans, again, you'll hear them called by both names, are organized by year and almost always, I encourage researchers to start in the 1924 set. There's two reasons for that. The first is, the later the map, the more robust the coverage, the more areas get covered in Toronto. But also, I want to introduce this, uh, this idea of uh, doing this research from contemporary backwards. Sometimes people come into the archives, they think their house is 125 years old, so they start way back in the 1880s when it's a bit unclear what you're looking at. It might be a farmer's field, it might be even be a forest, it's hard to figure out. So you're going to apply this principle of, you know, start with what you know and work backwards. This is the best way to get this, to bring the story together. So let's hop into the 1924 set. You click on the link, you get a series of indexes. You have to have a sense roughly where your building is in the city. I know I'm west of Dufferin, south of Annette, so let's click on that now. And you're brought to the key plate. This is the first uh, page in a Goad's uh, atlas, in a set of Goad's atlases. And each one of these colored rectangular boxes represents um, a map. Now, this is actually pretty easy for us because we know we need to be just to the east of High Park. Do not worry at all if you don't get the right plate the first time round. Often it takes quite a bit of back and forth to get the right neighborhood. Click anywhere within that colored rectangle to bring up the corresponding map. Here's plate 59. All right, let's start to unpack these. What are all these details? So the first is the navigation tool. The most important thing for you when you're doing this at home is the plus and the minus. Notice how much tiny little handwritten detail is on these maps. You need to be able to get in really close. And the maps are really well photographed for that reason. So the, this is your navigation tool to get around these maps. I also always, when I'm doing this research, make note of my plate number. That's because more often than not, my neighborhood will stay the same plate through time. So it speeds up my search. I also like to point out these, this little note here that says C plate 62. That's referring us back to the index. So let's imagine we haven't got the right neighborhood. Let's say we want to see a neighborhood north of Bloor Street. See how Bloor Street is the furthest most northern street on the map. It's just an instruction to tell you to go back, pull up the next plate north, which is plate 62. And you'll get these directions on each side of the map. Okay, I'm in the right neighborhood. I can see Roncesvalles. 
sorry, before we move on, do make note of the ward number as well. Ward numbers have really changed quite a bit through time. So when I'm doing this research, I like to make note, well, I'll say something like, you know, 1924, my neighborhood is ward six. That'll become relevant a little later on and I'll tell you more about that. Okay, let's zoom in. Again, I'm using that arrow plus sign to zoom into the map and I can see, okay, yes, there's my building there. It has that funny T shape. So that's, that's the first thing I'm looking for. Now, I wanna talk about the colors. So this orangey kind of red color is a uh, brick. It indicates a brick building. So you're seeing lots and lots of little semi-detached and detached brick residential structures in here. Notice also there are some um, yellow buildings and yellow is frame, wood frame. I'm pointing out the Toronto Railway car sheds. That's um, an interesting building that's gonna come back to us in a minute. I also wanna show you some differences between the way a residential neighborhood and industrial looks. Over here on Sterling Road, I'm pointing out the pickle factory and Cowan's. Cowan's made um, cocoa. Can you imagine what the neighborhood must have smelled like in 1924 with a pickle factory and a chocolate factory? Delicious. All right, let's zoom in. And again, you're going to have to trust me, but the this tiny little number along the road is the first number you look for. Again, I'm sorry my photograph isn't a little better here, but you'll have better luck when you're working at home. That's the street number. So you always wanna start with the street number. I do also want you to be aware though, uh, the other number associated with your building is gonna be the lot number, okay? So you can see here it says 20. The lot number describes the land that the, uh, that the property is built on. And the lot number alongside a plan number, which is this rectangular number, is the legal description for your property. Um, if you're researching your own house, go get your tax record because that same number will show up on your tax record. Um, again, that number is really useful to you, uh, especially if you're trying to identify a home that's, you know, it's not so much of an issue here because we're right on the corner, but imagine you're researching a house that's in the middle of a block. Having the lot and plan number can really help identify exactly what building you're looking at when the street numbers aren't present. You're gonna find street numbers actually do change quite a bit. I also want you to make note here, see how it says Nipawa Street and then under Nipawa it says formerly Maybell Avenue. You see that here? So I'm always making note of old street names. I really wanna collect all the information I can off these GOADS maps. That is going to be your key to photo searching a little later on. If you imagine the city photographer gets sent out in 1924, He's going to be photographing Mabel Avenue and he'll, his photographs will get labeled Mabel rather than Mapleawa. So really, really useful tool for a lot of uh, a lot of different reasons. So remember this principle I've talked about, about starting with what you know and moving backwards. So plate 59, same same plate. I'm going to pull it up in the next set of maps available, which is 1913. And what a great map this is. Much better photographed, you can see here. So we've got... Um, Here's the building here, I can see it says 381, but notice how very different the back of the building looks. We can see it's still the same long brick structure in the front, but notice how that T shape is totally gone. And there's like two uh, uh, separate brick structures in the back. So depending on kind of the year of construction, this could be a garage. For some people, this also might even be a carriage house. But you can see how quickly and effectively, you know, even within 10, 15 minutes, you can, you can really mark the changes of your property using these maps. All right, so let's keep going backwards. Here is the next available set. This is 1903. Wow, look how different it is. So there's lot 20. You can see there's nothing built on lot 20. In fact, there's nothing built on any of the lots around Roncesvalles. It's, it's almost completely blank. There are a few places, oh, sorry. There are a few uh, places constructed here. Um, you can see some frame structures over on Dundas, but really very little. So again, what a powerful way to start to understand a neighborhood's growth because just using a few maps, you've now figured out this 10 year range, right? Between 1903 and 1913, when most of our neighborhood is developed. Okay, take a breath, take some water, have a break. Chapter two, city directories. Now, um, I'm interested in your questions. Again, that's gonna be where some of our funnest conversations will be. So think about, think about what's coming to you in, in terms of your own research. Oh, okay, let's get back into it. Chapter two, city directories. 
we are going to be moving from answering questions of where to answering questions of who. We want to know who in the world lived in our building. Toronto City directories are easily accessible to you through the Toronto Public Library. You do not need to have a library card. You don't need to live in Toronto to access these. Like the GOADS maps, they're organized by year, but notice there's a lot more years available. In fact, city directories were made every single year. Um, they are an incredible tool. And I want you to think of them sort of like um, the grandmother of a phone book. This is what the uh, online index looks like. When you choose your year, you're going to be choosing that year based on a couple things. I always, again, I always encourage researchers to start with a year where they're pretty confident that property is there and then work backwards. Um, I'm gonna choose 1924, because remember I saw the property there in place in 1924. And city directories, you know, they're just gold mines of, of uh, information for us. Um, they're organized two ways. Often the first half of the book is alphabetical by street, and the back half of the book is alphabetical by family or business name. And we're gonna actually be using both sections today. There's a way to kind of cross-reference. So let's start looking inside. So I know my property's on Roncesvalles. I need to flip to R Roncesvalles. Here we are here. I want to show you what the beginning of the entry looks like. Notice here it says Roncesvalles at the top, uh, north from junction of Queen West and King at Sunnyside to Dundas West, sorry, Dundas Ward 6. And then it says East Side, one, three, five. And then you get a diamond shape, Grafton Avenue ends. So the way city directories are organized is, um, you know, imagine yourself walking up door by door all the way along the east side of Roncesvalles, then they come all the way back down to the bottom and do all the west side. And that, that stays consistent. That pattern is how, they or, how these are organized through time. Notice the last entry on this page is actually uh, 187. So I, need, I know I need to flip on, I need to go on a little further. This is your flipping page tool. And the slider bar at the bottom is for you know, larger navigation when you wanna move through bigger chunks of the book. So let's flip the page. I just simply look down this, the row and to my address. There's my address there, 381. Okay, and what do we find? S. Caulfield and Sons Limited Dairy. Okay, interesting. And notice also below 381 and a half is Charles Caulfield. Now, often a half is, is an apartment above. That's, that's my best guess on what you're seeing here. But already I'm curious, why, you know, who is this Charles guy? Notice he has the same name. So is, is he the son? Is he one of these sons? I'm, all, I'm already starting to kind of make note of these things I'm, no, you know, things I'm noticing here. I also want to make note 383, that corner building is listed as a home bank. When you're doing this research for your own um, house, I would always, I always encourage researchers, do make note of the neighbors on either side of you. It, you can make note of all the neighbors on the street, which is a great way to start to sort of look at patterns of immigration in, in, you know, to neighborhoods. But it's, it's really useful to know the immediate neighbors so that as you go back into older records, you can use these tools to identify exactly what house you're looking for. Okay, so this is where it gets really fun. Now that we have a name, and again, for, for this building, we already know it's a dairy, but when you are researching a residential property, more often than not, it's just going to be a name without any other information attached. We need to flesh that out a little bit. So that's why we're going to go now to the back half of the book. We're going to look up C for Caulfield. And again, you're going to do this with whatever name shows up at your address. And the reason you're going to do that is because um, the street sec sorry, the name section tends to be more robust, you get more information, but also more often than not, there will be more than one person living in your building, living in your house. So you'll be able to see the names of the various you know, people who live there. Now, here's Caulfield from the same year, 1924. Look how interesting it is. So now we've got more information on Charles. We can see it says Charles, he's the manager of S. Caulfield and Sons. He lives LVS at 381 Roncesvalles. Okay, great. But I'm also now noticing here, Frank. See Frank uh, Caulfield, dairyman? He lives at Seven Howard Park. That's, you know, a block and a half from the building. And what about this guy? I can now see Samuel Caulfield is the president. So that's the S obviously in Samuel, uh, in S Caulfield and Sons. And his house is 49 Boosted. So again, quite close by, about two blocks away. I also see here another, uh, another character who's gonna come into play, William G. 
Caulfield. He's the treasurer. And again, he lives at 41 Howard Park. So lots and lots of family members in and around this dairy. I'm going to tell you a quick story. One of my favorite research researchers, I, I was doing this exact type of research with a woman in the archives a couple years ago. And uh, she was working her way back and she found the original owner of her house using this technique and just began to sob, just tears, tears, tears in the back of the research hall. She discovered that the original owner of her house was a tinsmith. And of course, for her, that was really significant because she just recently uncovered these amazing tin ceilings in her build in her house. So, you know, there are often these wonderful little breadcrumbs that you're going to find about your own property, something probably you know that nobody else does. So let's apply this same technique. We can see the picture of this dairy in 1924. So let's just pull up a, an earlier city directory and use the same, use the same technique. Uh, okay, so here's 1920, very similar type of entry, Caulfield S and Sons Dairy. Uh, notice there's a different tenant at 381 and a half, Stuart and James Botswick. Keep going back, 1913. Now I've, I've chosen this year specifically because I uh, remember this was the last year that we actually saw the um, building appear on a map. And notice the entry is a bit different, Samuel Caulfield Dairy. So it, it, it's the dairy business in its previous life before the before the end sons, basically. Notice also how the home bank is a grocer, uh, Robert N. Dowsley grocer. From here, what you're gonna do is probably go back year by year. Because again, remember 1913 is the last time we see the property on a map. So I'm gonna be checking every single year from here on in to, to um, narrow in on the year of construction. 1912, I can see, yep, there's the entry. Got the grocer on the corner. But here's 1911. Now, how do we actually figure out that the building is not there? We need to use our cross sections, our, 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 our intersecting streets. So two entries above, do you see just two entries above this arrow, it says Jeffrey Street intersects, and then two entries below Howard Park. Well, I know for a fact my building has to be between those two, that, you know, in, within those two blocks on the east side. So the only options for us in 1911 are George Huntley, unfinished buildings two and vacant. So this is what you're trying to achieve. This is where you're trying to get to with the city directories. You wanna find a year where it says unfinished building, vacant or no address at all. And then the next year uh, is how you're gonna determine when a property is actually constructed. Okay. Now, Pull up my notes here. This is a record that you cannot find online. And again, today's focus is all about online research. However, it was really important for me that you understand what kinds of information is available to you from your local archives. It doesn't have to be the Toronto archives. All local municipalities keep tax records. And that's what I'm showing you here. Archives won't be closed forever. I do want you to be inspired to go into your local archives because there's a whole nother layer of information we can find. So tax records are, are basically records that are collected uh, for the purposes of charging property tax, um, but they can be used in a number of ways for research. So can you see Sam Caulfield's entry there? There it is there. Remember I said it was important to make note of the ward. That's how these are organized. You can see at the top there, it says ward six, division three. And again, an assessment role just is a lot more information that you can build on from the city directory. I'm going to describe the information as we see it from left to right. So the first column is the name. That could be the tenant or the owner. The next column over is the age of that person. So now we learn Sam is 50 and he has uh, voting status. MF is the next column over, manhood franchise. Notice that the women on this page, Bessie Martin above, she doesn't have any voting status. Uh, next column over, freeholder or tenant. So we learned that Samuel is the F, the freeholder, and the occupation is listed as dairy. I love the occupation column here. I don't know if you can read it, but at the title it says occupation or S, M, or W. So for a man, that's an occupation. For a woman, that's single, married, or widowed. But notice here, uh, Bessie Martin, I like this, has her actual proper profession listed. She's a ladies' tailor. Okay. 
The next column over is the actual owner column. So you can see Sam Caulfield lives there and he owns the building. If the owner does not live in the building, you'll see like for instance, the entry above Mary Cornelius, her address where she lives is 50 Walker Avenue. Um, and then the next column over owner, the address, that little ditto just means same as above. So they don't wanna write out Roncesvalles a million times. And one entry continues across both pages. Here's the rest of our um, entry for our property. So this is the size of the lot, 40 by 125. You get the mill rate and all of the property values. The two columns I really wanna point out are religion and total number of residents. So I know one of us, uh, one of the people in this workshop today is studying ethnographic research in Parkdale, particularly around gentrification. I just wanna point out this religion column because I know a lot of researchers have used this religion column in the past to study patterns of immigration. There are streets in Toronto where you'll find every single family has got a J, they're all Jewish. You'll also see the city recording things like Chinese in the, religious col in the religion column. So again, it's a, especially cross-referenced with something like uh, the census, the national census, these records can really be very valuable. Also, total number of residents kind of surprised me. I was, I was surprised that there were six people living in our building. Um, it's kind of interesting. Okay, so let's just step one year back. Again, this is the previous year's assessment role. And again, this is sort of the gold of what you're looking for. Because what you can see here is the actual process of this lot getting purchased by Samuel Caulfield. So what you can see here is the original owner, which is a, that stamped name, National Trust Company Limited Liquidator, crossed out and then Sam Caulfield's name um, written over top. I know Ellen, who owns this building, has a great story about this. There's sort of a, a Mark Twain character here. Ellen, can you hop in and tell us about yeah. National Trust? Well, the reason you see National Trust is because of a character called Joseph Phillips. And many of you probably know about him. He was the one who built the, the I guess, it, the building at the, the large building at the corner of Fermanagh and uh, Roncesvall. Um, it was built originally as the head office of York County Loan and Savings Company, which Joseph Phillips was president of. He, had, he was an extremely entrepreneurial man. Uh, he bought most of the land from Bloor, south of Bloor, between High Park and uh, Lansdowne, actually. Uh, but he was operating what essentially was a Ponzi scheme. Uh, he would encourage uh, people to buy shares in his company with weekly deposits. And at the end of three years, they get 4% interest, something like that. But if they miss one payment, they forfeited the money. Well, there are a lot of unhappy people. Uh, and in the end, Phillips was arrested, charged and, uh, charged and uh, went to prison in 1906 for five years in Kingston. Now, uh, National Trust became the liquidator of his assets. And what's really interesting too, is that Robert Holmes Smith was the lawyer who did the liquidation. And many of you probably know the name of Robert Holmes Smith. He was the one who developed the Kingsway he developed Bobby Point, he developed Riverside Drive in West End Toronto. Uh, basically, he learned uh, about the development industry by selling off these properties and liquidating these assets. So that's the story of Joseph Phillips. It's, uh, it's interesting, again, how you see the crumbs appearing in different places, the, yeah. the traces left. Yeah, thanks, Ellen. Um, this just proves my point. We, we, you did it. You guessed the right year. You know, the majority of us guessed uh, 1913, uh, sorry, 1911, and you're exactly right. You can see the vacant, the, the building is probably not there in the first part of 1910, probably built sometime in 1911. So excellent job. Okay, my friends, let's go to the fun part. Chapter three, photo searching. This can be just so fun. So how do we find the archival photographs we want to put on our walls, put in our research? Well, it's back to Toronto Archives. This time we're gonna jump right into the actual database. The only thing that really messes people up is sometimes we accidentally search in the wrong place. The search box at the top, it's confusing. It's not your fault. It's just that the Toronto Archives belongs to toronto.ca, which is a massive website. 
that top search box you use for you know finding swimming lessons the bottom search box here within the actual website is what we need so let's click on search the archives and it's going to land you in this search page now this is our mobile search page if you are working on a tablet a phone this is what you're going to use however if it's available to you, a lot of us prefer the desktop interface. It looks like this, okay? And for me personally, it just gives us a lot more control on um, how we're organizing and looking at our material. Again, if it's, if it's available to you, if you have a desktop, this is sort of my preferred method of search. Notice you can always toggle back to the mobile, mobile friendly interface. Now, first most important thing, make sure no matter which site, which index you use, start with scanned photographs only. So we want to be searching collections that we can see uh, available to us online. And from there, it's a keyword search. Now, I always encourage my researchers, just start with your address, just start with the actual street address. Um, it's rare that photographs are described down to the address level, but it's always worth a try. But sometimes it does happen that, you know, the TTC is there doing work or they have to replace the sidewalk in front of your house and you will find a photograph. More often than not, however, the most powerful keyword is gonna be the actual just simple street name. Um, and again, remember, you've already done all that legwork on your go, so you know what the street used to be called. So you've got this collection of, of uh, neighborhood names that you can now use as your keywords. I'm going to start with intersections. I, I looked, I, I did search for the address and no photos came up. So now what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to start with the closest intersection, Roncesvalles, Nipua. I only get one photo coming back. Here's what it looks like when you're looking at the photograph. First that comes up is the, all of the kind of the description about the photograph, including all the information we know in terms of the date. Um, notice here also at the bottom, the second from the bottom says copyright conditions. Always you should be able to know if you can use this image, what, you know, what are the copyright restrictions and you'll find as you do this work, you know, our whole purpose is to put put out records that are available to people. So you're going to see either public domain photographs or, do, or photographs where the, uh, the copyright is owned by the city itself. And that means those are public records for all of us to use. Um, to click onto the actual image to see it, you've got to click onto the thumbnail there and it'll bring up the corresponding image. It's kind of a nice photograph, but it's a little late for us. It doesn't give us all that much. The date is April uh, 1959. You can see there's our building there. I do know for a fact that one of the people in this workshop actually has ancestors who lived at 14 Nipawa across the street. What's weird about this photograph is there's actually a person standing in front of 14 Nipawa. You can see is a white shirt and pants on. I just, I wonder, maybe that's the ancestor I would love to know. Uh, maybe we can talk about that in a minute. Okay, so only one hit. We've got to, we've got to get a bit creative with our search terms. Um, so I'm going to try Caulfield. Notice here I've used a wild card, a little asterisk at the end of Caulfield. That's a really useful search technique, especially think back on all the variations of Caulfield that we've already seen. S. Caulfield and Sons, Caulfield Dairy, with an apostrophe, without. This is just a way for you to capture all the variations on that name Caulfield. So we've got 18 hits coming back to us to explore. So let's take a look. This is one of the first photographs I found, and it's just beautiful. I love this shot. Initially, I thought this was our building, um, but there are a couple clues here that were confusing. This is one of them. So I know this is the actual Toronto Railway sheds. Remember, we saw this building. That's the building that showed up in yellow on the uh, goads. Also behind it is Tower Automotive. That's the building today that houses um, the Contemporary Art Gallery. So this is Howard Park. This is this is just uh, two streets north of where we need to be. But this is a total mystery to me. Why are there two Caulfields, like two blocks from one another? That just didn't make sense. Here's another shot I found in the health department of the same building, different angle. And now here I can see it says 45 on the door. So again, I know it's not my building, but why were there, why are there two Caulfields? It's very, it's very kind of confusing. Well, the answer came when I found this photograph. This is a collection I really want to direct your attention to. One of you asked, one of you submitted a question before, you know, before this before we actually had our workshop, talking about what's new in the collection. Well, this is the collection I'm most excited about, one of the newly scanned collections. It's called the collection of the Ruddy, E.L. Ruddy Company, who made billboards and signs for all across the city. So we can see here, this is a Caulfield's billboard from the 30s, and it explains this situation. You can see we were looking at photographs of 45 Howard Park. That's the main office. 
Remember also we saw all those Caulfield family members living in and around Howard Park. And our building we can see here is actually the Roncesvalles branch. Notice this is a, a network of seven branches. And what a great document for us to be able to see this network, this dairy network of how they distributed milk through the city. I wanna point out this little building here, 381 Greenwood. Remember I said we were gonna open up a box. So let's do that now. Again, this is what a building permit application plan box looks like. Initially, I was really hopeful that um, when I found these in the description, I was searching again by the term Caulfield, that these were gonna be plans of our building. It's not, it's plans of the Greenwood Dairy, 381 Greenwood. In fact, it's actually plans for a retail addition. Can you see in the bottom right corner there, they're putting in a retail store. I'm gonna show you one shot of the first floor plans. I gotta apologize. I know this image is not all that easy to see, but uh, I wanna include it for you just so you can get a sense of how a Caulfield's dairy is laid out. You've got retail department, milk, butter, eggs. Behind that, room for empties. And behind that, new cold, loop, cold room, cork lined. So again, there's one of the archivists I, I trained with told me sometimes when we can't answer the question, we can answer around the question. And what he meant was, we can provide context that helps us understand why things are or why things look the way they do. I kind of wanted to, I thought this plan made that argument. All right, we also find a number of photographs of uh, advertisements. Now these are actually designs for outdoor signs. They're not actually the signs themselves. Again, from Ruddy, you can see I'm, I spent a lot, I, I love this collection. I want you to explore it. Um, we, we get a sense of what Caulfield wants to communicate to us, where its milk is coming from, Denal the Farms, that's near the Don River. Also, lots of ads that emphasize the safety of the milk for children is quite interesting. Here's another one, vitamin D milk, irradiated and homogenized, badge of merit. Okay, I also just want to make the point that um, newspaper searching can be really valuable here, especially if you're searching, you know, a business that's been, uh, you know, done any advertising in the city. These two ads for Caulfields I found in the Toronto Daily Star. I don't have enough time to walk you through newspaper searching today. Just a note that if you have a Toronto Public Library card, you have full and open access to the Toronto Star and it is just a treasure trove of material. Now, um, my last slides are, are uh, providing a bit of context on the story of milk and dairies in the city. At this point in your research, uh, this is where you're going to want to pull in some of the writings that has already been have, has already been done about Toronto history. There's so many good resources to explore. I'm sending you a link to my favorite place to buy Toronto local history books, and that's um, um, the online gift shop of the uh, Toronto Museums. Great place to get local history. I can tell you about this story of milk because we did an exhibit at the archives all about food manufacturing and uh, it's a, just a fascinating story, but it centers around this guy. This is Dr. Charles Hastings. He's medical officer of health um, starting in 1910 in Toronto. And it's just, it's hard to overemphasize how influential this guy really is. A lot of people think he was really um, influenced by tragedy, his own two children contracted typhoid after they drank milk delivered in the city, dairy milk. And his youngest daughter actually died, his infant daughter died. And he starts this crusade of cleaning up the milk supply, which um, goes right from the dairy all the way down to delivery. So this is a shot, I'm gonna show you a series of shots that were all taken by the city photographer for Charles Hastings in May of 1913 that show you this new process of how we're gonna clean up the milk supply here in the city. We think this shot's probably Union Station. You can see the contaminated milk going down the sewers here. Um, I just love this photograph. This is sort of, you know, I can imagine this is an early morning shot. That's the back of old Union Station there. You can see milk coming in from all, all across Ontario by rail. And then various shots of the testing equipment. So on the left is the dirt tester. On the right is the lactometric reading. So that's how much water is in the milk. Um, here are some shots of inspectors actually taking milk off trucks. Now it's not Caulfield's truck, but you can imagine our, our dairy is subject to these same types of tests. They're taking samples for chemical analysis here. And again, these inspections reached all the way into the dairies because of course the conditions of the cows, the conditions of the, um, of the farms really influenced, you know, um, the health and safety of this milk. And it kind of gives you more context now for understanding these ads, which all emphasize the cleanliness, the badge of merit. You know, 
Caulfield started ranking dairies based on sort of their report card of cleanliness. Caulfield's is about sort of number three in terms of its size around this time uh, in terms of dairies in the city. Because of this, Toronto is way ahead of the game when it comes to things like pasteurization, one of the first cities in North America that starts seriously pasteurizing milk. This is a shot that we don't know a ton about. Um, we don't know exactly what dairy this is, but it is a really kind of special shot, an early shot of pasteurization in the city. It's taken from the Consumers Gas Company. So again, the subject is the, is the gas fittings that you see here. I'll leave you with it. my few kind of breadcrumb photos that I found of Caulfields. Here's a shot inside a garage. Now I talked with Ellen and we tried to debate whether this could be our building. It looks too big. Uh, we sort of came to the consensus. This is probably the headquarters on um, Howard Park. This is my single favorite shot that I found. Um, what's, what's curious about it is that the photograph is labeled emergency truck. The, that white handwriting that you see at the bottom of the photograph, that's the actual, that's the actual photographer who's written that on the negative um, in black so that it shows up, you know, in white when you make a print. I had to call another archivist to ask what is a dairy emergency and her best guess was this is the truck that comes around and um, gives you the milk that, you know, if, if your order got missed, if you didn't get your milk, this is the uh, delivery that'll come and sort of fill those orders. So what happens to our dairy? Um, well, in 1947, our dairy is purchased by a large American dairy called Borden's, okay? And our branch operates as a Borden's dairy into the 1950s. Now, in the city directories, the listings then change in the 50s from Borden's to Milk Bar. And then in the late 1950s, you see a wholesale change. The, the, the dairy is gone and um, the, the building is listed as uh, Benny's Draperies. So a fascinating little story. My last shots just are uh, some contact shots, my very favorite shots of Roncesvalles. Let's imagine we're just walking down Roncesvalles and you can um, get, a, get a flavor for the street. So here's the Review Theater in 1935. A gorgeous shot just south of our building, literally just by step south of the building we studied today. This is Arnold's Bakery. Again, notice the collection is EL ready. Further down south, here's a shot looking um, sort of from Pearson, roughly where, where Pearson is. You can see the, the 504 line there. And finally, all the way down at the Edgewater Hotel. This is probably the most, or one of the most uh, well photographed intersections in the entire archives. Um, this is King, Queen and Roncesvalles. A lot of really brilliant shots of this, of this area. So thank you so much for listening. Um, my whole goal here is that you feel inspired to start exploring yourselves. And so thank you again so much for listening.